confident that many, if not all of you flute players out there, either do warm up with harmonics or have in the past. It's a great way to warm up because your fingers are not involved with generating the different registers of your flute. One of my flute students this year told me that the reason she finds harmonics so helpful is that she has to be able to, purely with her air and her embouchure, go from one octave to the next and nothing is changing with her fingering to aid that octave happening. I may do another video spelling out more specifically how to practice flute harmonics and give you a few harmonic exercises. That's not what I'm going to do today. Today the focus is on the mathematics behind harmonics because I've found that many of my students have never been taught about it and Music is numbers, whether that's rhythms that we play music in meters, four, four, three, four, we have specific note values, but music is also mathematics in terms of the pitches that we hear and the way those pitches are generated. That's what I'm going to focus on today. But if you'd like more explanation about ways to practice harmonics, leave a comment. I'm happy to return to this topic. It's a huge topic. I'm not trying to cover the whole thing today. I'm sure that just as many of you practice harmonics or have in the past, many of you have learned about the Pythagorean theorem. That's a squared plus b squared equals c squared on a triangle in case that rings any bells. And that theory was developed by Pythagoras who lived from 570 to 490 BC. Pythagoras is often called the father of mathematics, but did you know that he's also often called the father of music? And given what we've said, that all music is mathematics, that only makes sense that the guy who was really interested in delving into geometry and math also made a lot of discoveries about the mathematical nature of music. So if you study intervals in music, those are determined by mathematical relationships. Pythagoras is credited with discovering that if you have a string and you make that string sound, maybe you pluck it, maybe you bow it in our era, you will get a certain pitch. But if you take a string that's half that length and do the same thing, the pitch generated will be an octave higher. If you look at the length of the strings inside of a piano, you'll see right away that they vary a lot. And that is due to these mathematical relationships. The low note strings have to be very long and then each octave that you go up, they have in size. So the high note strings are very short. It's all about mathematics. Or if you take the same string and you dampen it in the middle and pluck one half of that string, the same thing happens. You get an octave ratio. So that's a very simple ratio of one to two that gives us an octave in music. And other intervals are generated similarly. The more simple the ratio, the more simple or perfect the interval is that we hear. So the intervals of an octave, a fourth and a fifth, those musicians know as perfect intervals. They are called perfect intervals because the ratio, the mathematical ratio that generates those intervals is very simple. One to two, one to three, four to three, those kinds of simple ratios. I'm not going to reach in the piano and show you this because I don't want to get my finger oils and stuff on these piano strings. But were I to go down and push in the middle of the A55 string and then pluck one half of that A55 string, you would hear an A110. If I were to divide it into thirds and pluck the string that's one third the length of the original string, it would be an octave plus a fifth higher, which is the next note in the harmonic series. If I were to divide it into fours, and pluck the string that's one fourth the length of the original string, that gives you two octaves higher than A55, so it'd be A220. For our purposes playing the flute, it's good to know that that length of the string that I'm talking about happens with pipes as well. If you look at a pipe organ and you play an A440 on the organ, that pipe that generates an A440 is a certain length. If you have the length of that pipe, you'll get an octave. So what happens in our flutes is that if we overblow and play an octave higher, our tube resonates due to how we're blowing and that causes it to go up an octave. There are other interesting pitch phenomena that we find with pipes. For instance, if you have an organ pipe that is open and you cover it, you close it, 
it goes down an octave due to the way that the air is resonating in the pipe. Same thing goes for our flutes. If only I had a cork, I'd stick it in the end of my flute and show you if I play a low B on my flute and then I cover the end, you get an octave lower. You can sound like a bass flute. How the air vibrates in the tube depends on how we blow. And that's why it's so useful to practice harmonics because as I started out saying, it trains our embouchure to know where to aim the air so that we get an octave higher. The flute is built on a semi-harmonic system. Some instruments will only give you the pitch that you finger, while other instruments like horn or trumpet have almost no keys or valves, and most of the way they generate pitches is using this harmonic series. We do, to some extent, have to use how we blow in our embouchure to get different octaves, obviously, but not to the extent of, say, a horn player. If you've had enough background in music, you might know that what I'm talking about with harmonics ties in to the overtone series. And overtones are pitches within a fundamental pitch that our ears cannot perceive, but they are there. So when you play a C on your flute, that's the fundamental pitch. And the flute doesn't have as many overtones as most other instruments. Oboes famously have a lot of overtones, so do violins. Flute is a pretty fundamental sound that's generated. But when you play a low C on your flute, not only is that C present, but the C that's an octave above is present, so is the G in the harmonic series, the C two octaves up. All of those pitches, even though we don't hear them with our conscious ears, are embedded within the fundamental pitch that we do hear. There's a simple way that we can prove that this overtone series, this harmonic series, is real and you can do it using any piano. This is a trick that I showed some of my students this past week and it kind of blew their minds and it reminded me that I intended to sooner or later put this all into a video. Here's the mathematical trick that I showed a couple of my students this week with a piano that they really loved and neither of them had seen it before, so I'm gonna show it to you as well. We'll start with a note that's quite familiar to many people, especially musicians, A440. If we play A440, that means that we have 440 little sine wave type beats going per second. And our ear's perception of that frequency makes it sound like an A440. If you go up an octave, it's twice as fast because the string in the piano is half as long. That's A880. If you go up again, that's A1760 and so on. If we go down, we have the same effect. So from A440 down an octave is A220. You go down another octave, it's A110, then to A55, and the lowest note on the piano is A27 and a half. Now that's low enough, 27 and a half beats per second is actually slow enough that our ears can kind of hear the beats. That's why when you play these low notes, they sound kind of growly and beady, as opposed to something up here, where the beats happen so fast that our ears cannot perceive the individual beats. What I wanna show you is how overtones are embedded in fundamental pitches and how these harmonic relationships work. So, if I go back to our A55 and I just press the key down, I'm not hitting it hard enough that the hammer inside strikes any strings, but the hammer is lifted, so now those strings that make A55 are free to vibrate. Now, if I just pick some random note to play, nothing much is gonna happen. If I play a D sharp, nothing really sticks around in our ears very much, but if I play something in the harmonic series, we will get sympathetic vibration because if I play A110, that's an octave relationship, and so the string is half as long, and the A55 will vibrate sympathetically with the two halves of its string because one half of that string length is an A110. Hope that all makes sense. So if I play A110, it really sticks around the A55 string is vibrating sympathetically. If you use the ratio of one to three, that generates an octave plus a fifth, which is this E. And it's sticking around really well, you can hear. Go up two octaves, that's another simple ratio, one to four. And we can continue up this series.
they're all sticking around because that A55 string is vibrating sympathetically because all these pitches are embedded in the fundamental pitch of A55. On the other hand, if I just go up and strike random pitches, you won't have anything like the same effect, especially if I avoid the pitches that are in the harmonic series. Not much is sticking around for our ears to hear. This may be all review for some of you, but I hope for some of you this has given a real window into understanding just how much music is mathematics. And to me that's a sign that there's order in the universe because the most beautiful thing in my life is music and the most logical, reassuring, orderly thing is math. I was a flute and math double major for a while and they all come together. If you've enjoyed the discussion or if you feel you've learned something, please leave a like. Subscribe if you haven't. 